we all have gone through a phase of stubbornness. Amen. Some of us are still in it. Um, but we have all at some point, one way or another, have gone through a phase of, we've said these words, you can't make me. I mean, can you think of, about a time where you stated those words to somebody that have asked you to do something? I mean, I have an eight-year-old at home, and sometimes he won't dare say, you can't make me. But the word no is pretty much the same thing, Right? Victor's not here to defend himself, so I won't pick on him. But we have all at some, st- some place, some stage or another, we have all been guilty of saying these words to tell, and telling people of importance or, and or of authority, you can't make me. You know that's Biblical. God can't make you do anything you don't want to do either. Let that sink in for a minute. He could make you, but he won't. God can make you do anything he wants you to do, but he chooses to give you and I that choice to be able to choose which path we want to take. Even if it is the long way around. When he says all you have to do is go here. And as a result of our stubbornness, as a result of our choosing of, of not wanting to heed his counsel or his directives, one of the main causes of or result of this is our lack of sleep. Did you know that insomnia is a multi-billion dollar industry in this country? If I were to ask you how many, how much do you think it costs the U.S. in its economy per year to deal with insomnia. How many of you think it's in the high hundreds of millions? How many of you think it's in the billions? Okay. A little higher. How about this one? $63.2 billion a year. What this amounts to is that for every employee that suffers from insomnia, there is an average of th- a cost of $3,225 and twenty, $3,225 per employee that doesn't get their f- right amount of sleep. I mean, I can ask you, please don't raise your hands, because I see some of you yawning already, like, Oh, I, didn't, I didn't have my sleep. And, and some of us, when we don't get our beauty sleep, we become cranky, right? And so then we, the first thing we grab is that nice warm drink that we are gotten to ourselves accustomed to, to get us that kickstart. And, and it becomes a vicious cycle. We begin compensating and, it, and we just keep on going down that hill. And, and, and please don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking about your personal habits here. But I am talking about what happens, the snowball effect it has on not just ourselves, but on environment, our society, the place we live, the place we work. There is a cost to that. And for, for those that own, own businesses, it's $3,225 more per employee because of health care costs. So here's some fun facts. 
20% less sleep than 100 years ago. When we are to compare our sleep patterns compared to those of 100 years ago, today we sleep 20% less. Yeah, that makes sense, right? Technology. I mean, I, I, I come from, uh, yes, I, I, am, I am dating myself, and, and, and I don't think of myself as being old, but I was, I'm, I'm part of that generation that grew up without cell phones. And you know, when you leave them at, at home and you, and you do things and you're like, oh man, I, I feel like there's something wrong, there's something missing, and, and they, they've become so part of who we are, they've become, be, you know, there's ingrained in our DNA per se that if, I don't, if I'm not doing anything, I'm wasting my time. 50% of those, or excuse me, 90% of those who are suffering from depression also suffer from insomnia. Depression is a very difficult disease to deal with because if you're in that boat, you don't want to admit it. And if you are in that boat and you do re- recognize, you don't want to reveal it. it there's a stigma that, that comes along with mental health, and that's a whole nother ball of wax. Here's another one. 10 million use prescribed medication for sleep. 10 million people use prescribed medications. That's not even factoring the over-the-counter medications, the, the, the oligo p- uh, gummies that we may choose to take or the, the um, melatonin, right? That's just prescribed. Hmm. Here's some more fun facts. The lack of marital relations is one of them is attributed to I'm too tired or I need sleep. I'll come back to that in another sermon. <laughs> Not today. <laughs> so, but you get the point. And as I mentioned earlier, we've become accustomed somewhere down the long, uh, along the lines that the busier we get, the more holy we become where we equate busyness with godliness. I can't think of a, a more false sense of, a more, a more false statement than this one. But did you know that there is only one animal in the, that deals with sleep deprivation more than we as humans do? Only one. I mean, I have a dog at home, and every time I look at her, she's asleep. You know, you have that saying, it's a dog's, it's a dog's life. You know, they're always asleep. Or, or if, you, if you own a cat, they're pretty much asleep. Um, if you have farm animals, they have no, no issues with going to bed at night when the sun goes down, right? Unless you own chickens. I remember every day when I was on a, on a mission trip, there were chickens running around, and at about five o'clock, before the sun was even up, there was this rooster. Oh, he was my cause of crankiness in that mission trip. He would come and he would crow at five o'clock on the dot every single flipping morning. And one day, he got so close to my tent, I said, I think we're going to have chicken for dinner. (laughs) I got out of my tent, and he's flapping his wings as he's about to crow. I go, and I swing, trying to kick him. And he runs away, laughing at me, like, (laughs) and 10 yards down the road, he crows. I'm like, oh, man. I need my sleep. 
But the animal, though, is not a chicken. The animal is asleep. That deals with that is a sheep. Sheeps or lambs, they, no, sheeps don't crow. <laughs> they deal with less sleep than humans. They only sleep 15% of the time. How would you like to function on four hours of sleep every single day? Some of you are like, well, pastor, I do that already. And if, and if that is your reality, be careful. You are very close to a breakdown. We are not designed to function on four hours of sleep. But sheep... They need the right environment in order for rest. They need to have a place where they can eat without being worried of being attacked. They need to be in an environment where there's no tension in the flock. There needs to be no bugs around them in the air to keep them distracting from their foods. And they need not to have hunger in the belly. Which brings to the text I want to share with you this morning. Psalm chapter 23, verses 1 and 2. It says, The Lord, you please read with me, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And he leads me beside still waters. Isn't it refreshing even just to think about the idea of laying down in green pastures and being led to peaceful waters? It is refreshing. But you know what's wrong with the statement? Our Western mentality does not depict the reality of the statement. As much as we may recognize, as much as we may see that, oh yeah, it's beautiful, it's refreshing, it's peaceful, it's soothing. This is not what David had in mind. The idea of having everything laid out with the perfect conditions in order for me to feel at ease. When we look at the actual literal translation into the English, this is what it says, At pastures dwelling grass, to, lie, to he lie down me upon waters, rest leads me. This is the literal trans- translation in its written form from the Hebrew. Well, pastor, how do we smooth it out? Well, we smooth it out. He makes me lie down in green pastures. But what's missing from this translation when compared to this one? Well, verse 1 is, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's verse 1. The little, so verse 2 is what the text I'm referring to. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. What's missing? He is not missing. He is actually there. How do I know? There he is, right there. He. Do you need to go back to it? You want to have another go at it? Still waters is there. Rest is there. Here it is. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Got it? He? No, he's there. One more time. Makes. He makes me lie down in green. The word makes is not there in the Hebrew, is it? At least not, not in, the, in the translation. As far as I, as I read it in the, in, in the original Hebrew, there is no he makes me lie down. 
how does that then factor in into our translation today? How, how do we get, where do we get this idea that he makes me lie down? Mm, don't get ahead of me now. <laughs> it is. It is a response to the shepherd. Because the idea of intimacy is related there. See, you can only make somebody when you are put yourself in a position to be led by, to be guided by, to be influenced by. That's how you are able to submit to, to another individual, right? If you look at it at, a, at a, a wholesome marriage life, the idea of what Paul is saying in, in Ephesians and in, in, in 1 Corinthians, when we love, we submit. We surrender. When there's a relationship, when, when there is an opportunity for you to communicate with someone, but in this instance, where you have a shepherd leading the sheep, the sheep have, the only relationship they have with the shepherd is that they trust him or her to lead them to a place where they can feel safe. But there's no communication. There's no dialogue. But it is a feeling of intimacy. It's a feeling of, and I'm not talking about an erotic feeling, I'm talking about a understanding a sense of you are taking care of me. See, this is implicit because the shepherd cannot make anything go against their wishes. You can't make me. If the Lord is my shepherd, he's not going to make me lie down anywhere I don't want to. He's not going to make me feel at ease besides still waters if I'm not at ease when I get there. There is a relationship factor in all of this. And when we begin to lead ourselves, it is most likely that we have pondered the consequences and have begun to worry about what might happen tomorrow. So if we, if we st read this psalm and say, the Lord is my shepherd, but yet I can't put my head to the pillow and fall asleep, it's probably because he's not leading. Probably it's because you're trying to lead the shepherd. Well, there's another verse in the Bible that I want to bring your attention to. Is the word remember. In Exodus chapter 20 verse 8 it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The key word here is remember because God can't make anybody here keep the Sabbath. No one is being forced to keep the Sabbath holy. I'm not going to get into what that actually means because that's not the point. When God gave the Ten Commandments, He says, don't do this, don't steal, don't, don't commit adultery, don't covet, don't lie, or bear false witnesses against your neighbor, honor your mother and your father, you know, Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Thou shalt not say my name in vain. But when it comes to the actual day of rest, God can't make you rest. God can't tell you, he, he's not going to tell you and, and, and put you in a position that says, okay, now you sit here and you be quiet. That's how we treat Excuse me, that's how we treat sometimes certain things in life. You have to do this. God doesn't make you do anything that you don't want to. You'll pay the consequences for it. But he's not going to make you keep the Sabbath. He's not going to tell you, don't do this or don't do that. He says, remember. 
Because with the, 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 I wear a wedding band. Does this keep me from committing adultery should I choose to? No. But what does this wedding band do? What, what's its, its function? To, to remind me of a covenant relationship I have with my wife. And to tell others, stay away. But this can't really keep me unless I remember. And so when we read this, this, this verse in, in, in the Decalogue, it says, remember, God can't make you observe it. Even though he created the world in six days, he took a break. And, he, and, he, and the world didn't come crashing down. What makes you think that your world will fall apart when you stop and smell the roses on the Sabbath? What gives us the idea that if we, oh, I've got to get this done, and, and, but this is the only time I have. Take a break. That's what the Sabbath is for. It's to give you that ability to reflect on the blessing God has given you. But I want to show you through a video what green pastures look like. You know, the, the Message Bible talks about you, you bed me down this lush meadow, right? We have this idea that when God leads us into this place of green pastures, it's a Midwest field of alfalfa that is as far as, you can, as the eye can behold, and there's absolutely no predator, no stress, no nothing in sight, right? Well, let me give you, or let me allow you to show you this video to give you a different perspective. As part of a shepherd lesson, I did want to look at one thing in the wilderness that will maybe surprise you a bit. Believe it or not, this is called wilderness, midbar, but it's also called green pastures. Now, when you take a Westerner here the first time and you look at this, you find people say, well, I don't know that I can go there because the Psalm 23, the Lord leads me into green pastures has been pictured as belly deep alfalfa. Well, you haven't seen any belly deep alfalfa. And from biblical time to today, it's rare to see a flock in the farm country. There isn't a lot of farm country in this culture. And so farmers kept the shepherds out as much as they could. Maybe they would come in a little bit after the harvest to glean what was left, but you don't want sheep where you can farm. This is the land of the shepherd. Right on the hillside across from us, you can see those grazing trails cut there by sheep maybe as long ago as Abraham's time. They're spaced so that an animal on one path and an animal on another can reach right to the middle between them. That determines the distance, so you can graze an entire hillside. And the shepherds lead their sheep across that hillside slowly, grazing what's there. Now you look at it from here and you say, what's there? In fact, I remember my first impression. I woke up one morning, I was sleeping out in the wilderness, and I remember waking up watching a flock of sheep on a hillside like this, and my, re my feeling was, what are those rock-eating sheep? I mean, what do they eat? How can you call this green pastures? Well, the answer is, there's a small amount of moisture present here. They get a little bit of rain every year, not much, but a little. 
Second, there is humidity in the air, especially in the evening breeze, like right now, you can feel it. Coming from the west off the Mediterranean, there's moisture in the air. That moisture, combination of the rain and the humidity, condenses or drips along the edge of these rocks here. And if you notice, right around the rocks, almost always next to the rocks, you get little tufts of green. Get one a moment. That's what we refer to as the green pastures. So the shepherd looks for a hillside. That's exactly what she was doing. Look at that flock across from us there, just stunning. Those two shepherd girls have found a hillside that either was exposed to the wind or had that small amount of rain. And they move that flock across the hillside and it's one mouthful here, walk a step or two, another mouthful, another mouthful, another mouthful. Now that changes the green pasture image a little bit, besides the picture changing radically. Green pastures are not everything you need for the rest of your life. If you make that belly deep alfalfa, then what God is saying, if you follow me, I'm gonna plunk you down and you'll never have to move an inch the rest of your life. Just reach out and grab it. Tell me that your life with God has been like that. Worry, said one rabbi, is dealing with tomorrow's problems on today's pasture. In the desert, you learn, the shepherd will get you what you need for right now. 10 minutes from now, you trust the shepherd. Just enough. Changes our perspective a little bit, doesn't it? When you, when you factor in the reality of the time when David was alive and the setting and the geography for which he lived. How often have we made the mistake of, of, of saying, how often have we made the mistake of saying, Lord, oh, if I can only lie down, I would be at ease. Our idea of that would also be contrary to the very first verse that we read in, 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 in excuse me, Psalm chapter 23, verse 1, where it says, The Lord is my shepherd, and I will, shall not want. The shall not want is not a permanent statement of blessings or a condition of always having what you need, but his having what you need at that moment in time. And so therefore when we go ahead of the shepherd and we begin to ponder the idea and the consequences of what might happen or what could happen or what might, might be tomorrow, we begin what the Greek here in this text in Matthew chapter 6 verse 25 when Jesus was saying, I therefore say to you, do not worry. You, did you know that in the Greek, the word worry means to divide the mind? If, you, if we take our mind completely out from God and our dependence on him, we divide our mind to begin to think, okay, God, you got this aspect of my life, but I, I, I've taken the lead on this one. We've set ourselves up for failure. And this is what Jesus is saying. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life. Don't divide your mind about what's going on. What you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? See, there are, there are things that we begin to grab a hold on to that we value to be of importance because we have conditioned ourselves that if I can control this, I'm good. We, be, we begin to act like stubborn children when we don't allow God to lead. We begin to say, you can't make me, and God will say, you're right, I can't, and I won't. And I will allow you to make your own mistakes. 
I will allow you to go down this path. I will allow you to go and see for yourself what the cost of this will be. But I'm here if you need me. You know, many times we have put ourselves in that position that we have taken the decisions without going to God. This morning, I want to leave you with just one question. We're not going to do round tables this morning. But what's dividing you? What's dividing your mind at this very moment that you need to turn over to God? There are things going on in your life, and, and believe me, there are plenty of things going on in mine, but in your own life, what's taking your mind away from God being able to lead you, to, for you to be able to get that morsel of food or whatever it is, of you, what you need, just enough so you can feel at ease, so you can feel safe, to eat so you can feel safe to sleep so you can feel safe to be led what's keeping you from that we all have different we all have are in different places we're all in different circumstances we're all in different stages in life but this morning we have a shepherd who wants to lead you He wants to lead you to that place where you can get that just enough to get you through until tomorrow. He'll lead you again and again and again. See, we have to stop thinking that God is going to lead us and then leave us because we've reached our destination. We have not. As a matter of fact, he's going to lead us And as long as we continue to trust in in allowing him to lead us, he will do it over and over and over to the point that no matter what comes your way, you will sleep soundly at night. There's a story about a kid. He saw a job posting for a farm to be the, the farm boy. And he went, in and he went in and he interviewed with the owner. And, and after the interview, the, the, the owner had one question for this, to this young man. And he said, why should I hire you? To his response was, I sleep soundly at night. The farmer, the owner kept thinking to himself, what in the world does this mean? So one day a storm rolled through. It was, so, it was, it, it was such a bad storm that the farm own, owner woke up and he went in to check and he saw that the chicken coop was shut and the chickens were at peace. He checked into the stables and he saw the, the, the sheep and the goats and the farm and the, uh, the cows and the horses all quiet, laying down, hunkered in into their stalls. And then he walked into the, the bedroom where that, that farm hand boy was, was staying and he all cracked open the door and he could see that the farm boy was fast asleep. That night, the the owner learned a very important lesson. To trust. To trust. See, when we allow God to lead us, he's not going to make sure, he's just not going to take you to that place and just leave you there. He's going to make sure you are safe. He's going to make sure that you can sleep at night. He's going to make sure that you have what you need. Whatever it may be, for you, it may be health. For, you, for some of you, it may be peace of mind. For some of you, it may be just the ability to know that you are safe. And that's a big ask sometimes. 
but you need to allow the shepherd to lead. Don't divide your mind. What's keeping you? What's, what's keeping you from dividing your mind? What's in your mind? Bring it to God. Allow him to, to turn it over to him. And he will lead you into green pastures. May God bless you.